I start writing bigger. I think I zoom in and I don't zoom back out. So I don't know if there's a way to fix that. If you have any ideas, I'm certainly willing to listen. All right, word problems. So we had a jet airliner flying east at 500 miles an hour and had a 70 mile an hour wind blowing 60 degrees east, north of east. And we're going to find the ground speed. So we got our velocity of the jet. That's the V, the big vector. And then the small one, U, is velocity of the air or the jet stream. And we just had to add them together. But we needed to write them in polar form. So polar form of vectors. <coughs> It's going to be magnitude of your vector times cos theta sine theta. And this is always going to be a unit vector. We just tested it real quick down here. Magnitude of cos theta sine theta is always going to be 1, regardless of theta. So our easy vector v is 500, 0. And then the more difficult one is 70, has a magnitude 70 times cos 60 sine 60. And then carefully just added those two together. And there's not much more going on than that. So there's our all of our work. Oh, and the last part, speed, is the magnitude of the velocity vector. So it's not just the velocity vector, but the magnitude of that. And second problem, we had a disco ball suspended by wires. One wire making 45, another making 30 degrees of the ceiling. And static equilibrium, we want to add up the three forces and have them equal zero, the zero vector. So we got force one, force, force one, force two, and force of gravity. So force of gravity is easy, just all negative y. Uh, force one, we're going to use 30 degrees. So the original 30 degrees up in the corner, but we want to measure the right way. Uh, also, our angle, our vector doesn't point this direction, so that 30 degree measurement. You want to make sure you have the angle, the vector pointing the right way. So we got our two vectors. The other angle is not 45 degrees because a 45 degree angle would be in quadrant one, so that would be a vector going that way. So we use a little bit of geometry right there that I would probably just call common sense. Once you pass geometry, it's pretty much common sense. So we got 135 is our real angle for our second force. Some of the forces are zero vector, so we add Fg, F1, and F2, and that needs to equal zero. So our forces come from these equations. So the gravity force is easy, zero, negative 75. Uh, force one, I don't know the uh, magnitude, but I know the angle. So we just leave it as magnitude force one times the unit vector in the right direction. Force two, same thing, magnitude of force two times the unit vector in that direction. And we computed those over here on the right. And we just add all three of those vectors up. And we get we want to get 0, 0. So the static equilibrium is actually static. And adding x and the other x and the other x together, we have 0 plus f1 square root 3 over 2 plus f2 negative 1 over square root 2. Do the same thing for the three y coordinates. So you really have two equations. You got an x equation. I'll double underline our x equation and the y equation. I'll just do single underline. So we want to match up the x's and the y's, which really give us two equations. And the good news is there are two linear equations and two unknowns. And those two linear equations are right here. So here's our x equation on the left and our y equation on the right. And you just use, you either go substitution or elimination. I went elimination because I saw F2s were going to cancel out super easy if I add them together. So I just went that way. Got magnitude F1 right there. And magnitude F2 down here. Now I'm going through this fast because our recording, uh, my recording broke. It didn't work. So this was way faster than I went through it originally. So please pause it and make sure that you believe all these things. Because it certainly didn't take us five minutes to go through this. It was like 20 minutes or something like that. So that's the end of 12.2. And now we're going to start it in 12.3.
And this is dot product. So dot product, we'll start with definition and do an easy computation example. So if you have a vector u, it will be in n dimensions. And vector v, also in n dimensions. u dot v. So the way we get this, uh, so I better write down u's coordinates. So we'll go, we'll just go u1, u2, dot, dot, dot. How many coordinates will you have? N coordinates, so we got UN and V is going to look really similar, just V's everywhere. V1, V2, VN. So when we dot them together, it'll be U1, V1 plus U2, V2 plus dot 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 UN, VN. So you multiply. Each coordinate, so the first coordinates get multiplied, the second coordinates get multiplied, third coordinates, and then you add up all those products. And of course, we can write summation notation I equals to 1 to n, u i, v i. So there's our dot product in summation notation. All right, so this should be familiar. Let's do an example. Computing the dot product's not hard. So we'll go with IJK notation here. So let u equal negative 1 half i plus 3k v 4i minus 2j plus k. And I want to know what is u dot v. So what's the slightly tricky thing about you? No J. So make sure I, J, K, make sure your middle coordinate is zero, not your first or last coordinate. So there's no J's. So if you want, a reasonable thing is to write out diamond notation. I think is a good first step. So I'll write out U, negative 1 half, comma, 0, comma, 3, and then you can write out V and then just go and do the dot product. Give you 30 seconds, should be plenty of time. So you should get negative 2 plus 0 plus 3. This isn't positive 1. Any questions on that dot product? So we'll go angle between two vectors next. So your vector is u and v, and there's an angle between them. We get that cos theta u dot v divided by magnitude u magnitude v. It's very tempting to put a multiplication symbol in the bottom like that, magnitude u times magnitude v, but that makes me think about the dot product a little too much. So I like to not put the magnitude, the multiplication symbol in the denominator. So I like to just write it out like this, and then I know I'm just multiplying on the bottom. So that is how to get cos theta. Now I'm not going to go over this because it would require the uh, law of cosines. You would, and it doesn't need to be a right triangle, even though I made it look like it was a right triangle. I work in any triangle, so we don't do the law of cosines. So I'm not going to go through why this is true. 
but go back to pre-cal 2 and in your book they do prove it there. Alright, so there's an angle between two vectors. <coughs> and of course you could solve for theta very easily. Just go with cos inverse. And if you're on web work, cos inverse is arc cosine. So there may be a web work question, and that'll be arc cosine. Cos inverse does not have very big range. So where did our inverse cosine come from? It came from regular cosine. which has a graph that looks like this, but of course you can't invert a graph unless it's one to one. So this is our original y equals cos x. And what we did is chopped off all that stuff over there and all this stuff over here and went zero to pi. So we did a restricted domain zero to pi. which is the range of cos inverse of x. So our range cos inverse of x is 0 to pi. And this just comes from the uh, domain of f is the range of f inverse and vice versa. So when you invert a function, the domain and the range trade places. All right, that means an angle can only between, be between 0 and pi between two vectors. What if the angle is bigger than pi? Like maybe um, 3 pi over 2. What angle do you think we'll get out of co the cos inverse? Theta equals cos inverse. There's another way to measure that angle. Pi over 2. So if you measure the short way, it's pi over 2. So this little one right here would be pi over 2. So you're always going to get the smallest angle between two vectors, not the, the big, the long way around. And so what's the biggest angle can ever actually be? Pi would be if they're pointing the exact opposite. So if you go past pi, you'd measure on the other side. So it's always going to measure the small angle between the two. So we can write that up here. So if you want to put parentheses, it's the smaller angle between two vectors, not the bigger one. So next up, definition, orthogonal. So any two vectors in n-dimensional space Now it doesn't really make sense if uh, the length is zero here. Orthogonal is another word for perpendicular. So if they're not zero and u dot v is zero, then u and v are orthogonal. You could use the upside down t notation for u orthogonal to t if you want. So that's what we use for perpendicular orthogonal right there. And I think it's a little less standard, but you could write parallel like that. None of these are going to work on web work. And if you're on a quiz, I would just I'll ask, are these orthogonal? And the answer will be yes or no. The zero vector, because they're vectors, so you wouldn't it wouldn't make sense to compare them to uh, the number zero. 
Now you could say it's the same thing as saying the magnitude is not zero. That's the number zero, yeah. So the dot product, sorry, the dot product is uh, always evaluates to a number, so a real number. <coughs> so if we go back to the definition of a dot product, so if you write it in some math notation. could write it like this. So the dot product is a function that goes from n-dimensional space times n-dimensional space. So take two vectors and it gives you a number out of the two vectors. So you would take u uh, comma v as your input and that is going to go to the number u dot v. So it takes two vectors as the input, n-dimensional vectors, and outputs to the real numbers. We're going to be doing a cross product which very specifically is a three-dimensional property, so, but that is a little bit weird because it takes two vectors and gives you a third vector. So it's a di very different product. And we'll see very soon why we use the word product. So make sure if you're doing a dot product, uh, you should be getting a number out of that, not a vector. So if you're getting a vector out of a dot product, something went wrong. So there's our definition. Now I want to find all vectors orthogonal to. That's our first example. And we'll use the vector 1, 1, 0. So you could try to graph this out, but anytime you actually graph in three dimensions, it's pretty useless. There are some things that you can do. Let's just pretend that, let's give this vector a name, we'll just call it V for vector. So if vector V looks like that right there, what do orthogonal vectors look like? It's basically every vector that is on this line right here. And that line will be the one that makes right angle with I probably only need to draw one of those, of course. So it'll be every vector on the dotted line right there. Now the question is, how do we figure those, how do we find those? So I could write any u that lives on the dotted line. First of all, how many dimensions does u have? u has three dimensions, so I'm not feeling creative. We'll just call them x, y, and z. So that'll be u, x, y, and z. <coughs> what do you know about orthogonality, or two vectors being orthogonal? Dot product is zero. So I want to know all vectors such that u dot v equals zero. So I want to find all combinations of x, y, and z such that u dot v equals the number 0. So we can write out u x, y, z dot v 1, 1, 0 equals the number 0. All right, dot product. This is easy to do. x times 1 plus y times 1 plus z times 0 equals 0. So it's all vectors such that x plus y add up to 0. You could solve it for either one. x equals negative y. So there's a few ways to write this. If you took linear algebra or if you remember pre-calculus 1. When we did linear algebra, I could write, there's a few ways you can write it. One way, x is negative y. So I it as y, nope, negative y, comma, regular y, comma, z. If 
for any 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 y z in the real numbers except what would be a bad value for my definition of orthogonal? As long as they're not zero. So what I don't want to say is the zero 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 vector is orthogonal. Nope, x isn't even in there, so it doesn't matter. With y, oh, and that word should not be and, that word should be or. Because you want to allow for the vector, for example, 0, 0, 1 is OK. So it's OK for y to equal 0, but not for y and x to both equal 0. And here you can exploit the zero product property and just say yz is not zero if you want. That's the same thing as saying y is not zero or x is not zero. Just saying the product is not zero. Maybe. No, because only one of them being zero would make that product zero. So that product, oh yeah, you're right. That would be an int. Yeah, so we have to leave it like this then, with the or. OK. Now if you want to parameterize this, you could write it x, y, z equals to use s and t. So we'll go negative s, regular s, and t like that. So the first two coordinates are opposites, opposite signs of each other, and whatever you want for your second coordinate can go in there. So this is any st in the real numbers, uh, s not zero or t not zero. What happened? It looked like so our answer was two dimensional. But it looked like the vectors had to live on this line right here, which is one dimensional. So what is the problem with this drawing? That line is actually a plane. That line is actually a plane. So we probably shouldn't call it a line then. <laughs> so we'll call it dotted plane. Now it's a dotted plane. There we go. That works. All right, that's the problem with drawing. You in three you're drawing on a plane, so you're always at a disadvantage if you start drawing. So just be careful. Anytime you're in three dimensions and you start drawing, you're basically making assumptions. So it's generally a dangerous thing to do. You could set up a. Uh, if you really want to go full linear algebra, this is your matrix right here. You got an x, a y, and a z column like that. So if you want me to really speak linear algebra, and that makes you happy, and the constant, constants over there on the right. So you got one free variable. Uh oh. Yeah, you got one free variable. It's z. Actually, I have two free variables. X is the only one locked down, if you use the language that I use. So that one locks down X. So that leaves Y and Z to be free. Not in this, not in this setup here. It's the first one right there, 1100. Zero, zero. All right, why do we call it a product? Because it has product properties. Mainly, it distributes across addition. So look at all the properties for dot product.
u dot b equals v dot u, u dot oh, uv, w are n-dimensional vectors, and our scalars will use c. I don't like that letter. Let's use alpha. I don't think we'll need a beta. No. So alpha will be a scalar, a real number scalar. So the main reason we call it a product is this distributive property. So you just distribute products across addition. And if you distribute whatever your operation is across addition, it's going to be called a product. So even if it's weird, it doesn't really seem like multiplication because we multiplied and then added, but it does have the algebraic property of products. So that property is why we call it a product. The zero vector dot any vector. So think of the zero vector as just all zeros lined up in there. So every product you look at, every individual coordinate is going to be multiplied by zero. Add up all the zeros, you get regular zero and number zero. When it comes to scalars with your dot product, you can move the scalar around. So you can take it out like this, or you could give alpha to the second vector. So you can multiply your second vector by alpha instead of your first. So you can move your scalar around. And last one, dot product is almost the magnitude. If you get rid of the square root on your magnitude, you got the dot product with itself. So we're going to just write u dot u equals magnitude squared. No, work doesn't suck. It's awesome. That's why you're paid to do it. All right, work. I'm not talking about economic work. We're talking about physics work. So work is a dot product if you're dealing with vectors. So work, W, is force multiplied by, or multiplied, dot product with uh, displacement. So F is a force vector, D is the displacement vector, there should be a space in there, displace me, Freudian slip of the pen, <laughs> displace meant vector. So we say displacement vector, what that means, you move from point A to point B. And displacement vector d is going to be n minus start. So in this case, b minus a. So it'll be your two points, and then displacement is the difference between them. And that represents, you could think of that as like the motion vector. All right, so that's work. And of course, we'll do an example problem. A box is pushed up a 30 degree ramp. That is 10 meters long. Ooh, with a constant force. Parallel to the ground. Of 40 newtons. Find the work.
So we already pretty much have the force vector. We just have to write it in a vector form, but it's parallel with the ground, so it's very easy to write that out. Let's work on the ramp first. So push up a 30 degree ramp. So you have a choice. Do you want your ramp to go? It's going to go one of the two directions. I say the first one because that will allow me to have my displacement vector going up to the right, keeping my coordinates positive. If I go the other way, uh, my vector would be going up to the left, and my left coordinate, my horizontal coordinate would be negative. So it doesn't matter which way you go. I'm just going to go with the right one or the left one, so I have a positive x coordinate. It's the only reason. So there's our displacement vector d. Now our force vector, force parallel to the ground of 40 newtons. So it's easy to draw your force vector. And I can put a angle. Our angle is 30 degrees right here. And this way, your 30 degrees is measured in the usual way from positive x-axis up to your um, the vector d. So everything is lined up in a regular way like this. All right, so d, displacement vector, what is the magnitude? Ten. So magnitude is 10. What I don't know is the x, y components exactly. So we're going to go to polars. Oh, coast data, sign data. That'll make a difference. So our just distance or magnitude is 10. Theta is 30. So we got 10 times square root 3 over 2, comma 1 half. So that'll be 5 square root 3, comma 5. So there's the probably easiest form of the displacement vector. F is super easy. So you got all horizontal, no vertical. So we're pushing with 40 newtons. So 40 to the right, 0 up. Now ready for work is the dot product. Five times 40, 200. 200 square root three plus zero. Newton meters? Yeah. Right, because we're measuring our force in newtons, our distance in meters, so those are newton meters. Is this a jewel? All right. So this is a good place to stop, I think, because this is the end of dot products. So we'll do cross products. What happens Friday? Midterm. So we got three, just two pages of cross product, three, three pages of uh, surfaces, lines of planes. So I probably won't finish 12.6, which is cylinders and quadratic surfaces. So I'm thinking we'll probably definitely go through 12.5, maybe or maybe not 12.6 for your midterm.